he was driving along in the golf cart and I said, um, he stopped and I said, Richard, I'm, I'm taking over from Josh for a couple of weeks. And he said, oh great, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning from you, which kind of took me aback to think, geez, this guy is looking forward to learning from me. I thought it was a really interesting thing to say. What if you had the opportunity to have coffee with your 18 year old self? What advice would you offer? And would you actually take the advice and offer? I'm absolutely fascinated by that question. I interview people from all walks of life, from Heineken Cup winners, New York Times bestselling authors, local taxi man, you name them, I've interviewed them. Be inspired, learn and grow from the experience of others. Welcome to the What I Know Now podcast with Mark Kelly. Today's guest is James Kluski. He's an ex-professional tennis player. He's been played for Davis Cup and he's Richard Branson's tennis coach. Welcome to the show, James. Thanks for having me. James, could you give me a little bit of an overview about your journey to now? I started playing tennis in, in the Parks tennis program when I was probably about six years old. My mom played a little bit of tennis. Brother and sister both played. And then it kind of grew from there. I was a shy kid, but loved tennis. And then I ended up getting on the Leinster squads and, and uh, started becoming more serious. Playing then four mornings before school, after school, just loved it got better and better and then uh, ended up being recruited to go to college in, in, in the States. So I went to LSU, Louisiana State University, which was a big change. It was, it's funny, my sister, when I was 17, my sister basically said to me, she's like, I don't know how you're going to survive. You, know, you can barely survive in Dublin, so how are you going to survive on your own in, in Louisiana? So the college sports is it's such a big thing over there and they, they're really into the sport um, and the facilities are top class, the coaching was great and I, I, I have no regrets about going, it was some of the best years of my life. What type of dedication do you need to be so focused in tennis? You know a lot of people talk about mindset, I think it's you know it's, it's prevalent in sport mm. and it's prevalent in business obviously and I think you really have to have that mindset for, for high performance and it takes yeah a serious amount of dedication but at the same time I would say it has to be fun. You know I was, I was training and, and obviously in the pro career traveling a lot but I never really saw it as being a difficult thing, it was more that it was fun and I really enjoyed doing it and, and I was positive about the whole thing, so I think that played as much a, as much a part of it. Because when you're younger, so many kids are just so hard to get out of bed, get them out, staying up nights and then when you get older, people are going out for drinks or whatever, was there sacrifices needed to be made? Yeah, there was sacrifices and I think it's, it's actually an interesting point because you know there is a challenge nowadays getting kids out and playing and obviously with technology now and kids want to maybe stay in bed a little bit longer or play their playstations and so on, but I think coaches can play a big factor in that. I think if a coach can create an environment where the kid wants to be there and wants to and is enjoying the sport and is learning a lot and feels like they're with a group of friends I think it's very important and I think it's an issue that needs to be looked at you know as in if you see teenage girls if you see the drop off in sport I think it's pretty worrying and we need to figure out how can we keep kids in sport longer. Did you have important mentors throughout your life that made a big opportunity for you? I was very lucky and I think you know I'd be big on quotes and, and things like that and, and I think there's a quote from Robin Sharma where it's maybe it's not him but it's surround yourself with the people you want to become and I'd be very big on that even even nowadays and I was very lucky that when I was 14 a coach moved from Canada to Ireland a guy called Larry Jurovich who um, really helped me he was, was a great coach <coughs> Um, and he was he was a great mentor off you know off the tennis court as well and he, he used to say things like you know your tennis is going to be affected by drink and women so you have to stay away from them for as long as possible so he was a great mentor and then when I went to college in the states the coach there was very good really a great guy and, and really helped me a lot and then even after my career now obviously we'll get on to it but meeting Richard Branson and then even some guys in Ireland some business people that I've met that I've you know asked to go for a coffee with and ask their advice I look up to a lot of guys and I try and get around them if I can what was it like getting onto the, the Irish Davis Cup team and just missing out on Wimbledon? Yeah, it was good and bad. Uh, <laughs> with uh, Davis Cup, I mean, it's one of those things that I actually still remember when I was playing parks tennis and then also I played in, in Swords Tennis Club at being you know, nine or ten years old and the coach at the time, he, he would say, OK, what's your goals? And I remember as a 10 year old writing down that I wanted to play Davis Cup and it's almost like you're a little bit embarrassed writing it down in front of the coach and to actually be able to do it for 
close to a decade. I still remember my first cap against Slovenia in Dublin and it's one of the things that I miss most about playing to be honest. Um, it's very hard to explain to people <coughs> even things like you know the national anthem and you feel like you're yeah you're representing your country and then the whole Wimbledon thing yeah it was very difficult at the time. I'm not going to say that I was crying and all this sort of thing. I was really disappointed. I, I, I had worked myself into a position where I was I probably should have made it and I think I was good enough to make it. I think I made a few mistakes schedule-wise, losing a few matches I maybe should have won. But that's life and I feel like I <coughs> gave the best in my tennis. I did as well as I could and I think it's, again, if you talk about mindset, it's, it, you know, I, I took lessons from it in tennis and in life and you just move on. So, so tell me, how did you start to become a uh, coach to Richard Branson? Most random. <laughs> yeah. Story, tell us about that. Yeah, so that's that, that's another address. So is um, I was lucky enough. One of the biggest tournaments I played, I played an ATP event, one with a Swedish a Swedish tennis player who's a top hundred doubles guy, and he was talking to me about this pro am that uh, Richard has on his island. And you know, I looked up the event, and I was like, "Geez, this is incredible!" You know, I mean, I've kind of told the story where I said that he made the connection, but it was basically just a a cold message on Facebook to one of the guys. So Andy Silstrom, my friend, his, his college, his ex-college teammate is involved in a company called Premier Live, which run the event. So this is 2015. I messaged him and I said, look, I'm, I'm retiring the end of the year. Not sure what I want to do. Would love to come and help out with the event. So I went for it and, and you know, I was, I was pretty nervous. I didn't really know anyone. So the Necker Cup is basically where Richard, there's a couple of different components to it, but Richard brings you know, Djokovic, Nadal, top tennis players to play with business people in a casual setting where people are having drinks and the tennis is kind of a byproduct of just the actual event. And then there's also a lot of very successful business people there. So I met some really interesting people and I got some great advice. And then from there, uh, when I was on Necker, I obviously met Richard and his coach and his coach, a guy called Josh Gilmore, is a great guy. Josh basically messaged me uh, about a month later saying, hey, um, I'm going on holidays and, uh, this month and is there any way you could come and cover me? And I said, oh, you know, what will I be doing while I'm there? And he said, oh, you hit with Richard twice a day. So I was like, yeah, I'm there. So um, it's kind of grown from there. Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And have you learned a lot from him? Yeah, I've learned so much. I mean, just he's incredible. I mean, we were talking pre-interview. I was telling you how I'm, I'm playing tennis every morning. And that's basically from him because I had kind of stopped playing tennis a little bit. But um, from seeing him and his kind of zest for life <coughs> and his enthusiasm for his well-being and he uses tennis as a, as a stress reliever and to relax and, and uh, compete and all those things. And then just as a, as a guy having a cup of tea with him in the morning, having breakfast with him, he's an incredible guy, an incredible personality. Um, and he's very helpful with, with things. I mean, I remember you know, a couple of different things. One, I, I, when I arrived in the island the second time, he was driving along in the golf cart and I said, um, he stopped and I said, oh, Richard, I'm, I'm taking over from Josh for a couple of weeks. And he said, oh great, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning from you, which kind of took me aback to think, geez, this guy is looking forward to learning from me. I thought it was a really interesting thing to say. And then the other thing was the, the first morning we played, um, he had to have known I'd be a little bit nervous, you know, just me and Richard Branson, cup of tea and then playing tennis. I mean, I was nervous about making him do a cup you, of tea. Do you let him win? Do you, <laughs> do you go really hard on him? What's yeah. the plan? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Yeah, that's the age old question. So I, I just keep thinking of, is it meet the parents where they're playing tennis? Play yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah, meet the parents with the uh, with the volleyball. Yeah, you know? I just like the ball. Yeah, you just just wondering how this plays out, right? Yeah, no, uh, I would um, I would make it competitive, you know. Okay. So uh, I've let him win a few times, but I would. Uh, he's got this incredible ability to make you feel comfortable and to make you. He's just a real people person, you know. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. He seems to be so warm and hospitable, isn't it? It's incredible. Yeah, he always makes you feel at home. He's just. He always. I mean, I was saying to someone, he, you always feel like he has time for you. So I remember I said to him one morning that I said, I'm, you know, I'm not sure what I'm, what I'm doing and with te after tennis and different things like that. And he said, so what are you doing? And basically, how can I help you? You know, and, and the interesting thing for me is I've been around a lot of, you know, a lot of business guys who are obviously incredibly busy and you kind of feel like they're in a rush with him. It's almost like he's got all the time in the world. He's, he sounds great and he's, he's come to Dublin in January. So 
Yeah. Fantastic opportunity to meet up with him again for a change. Yeah, look, look forward to it. Yeah, I was on to him. So, uh, and yeah, he's, um, he's looking forward to it. Tell me about making that transition from playing tennis, and we were talking about it before the interview about you're still playing in the mornings, to then kind of going into a full time job, back into, into, I suppose, the real world. And how do you feel that that is for other people that are in sports to do? Because I'm guessing it's a bit of a a challenge. I know when I interviewed mm. people like Frankie Sheen before, they mm. said it's a, it's a big challenge to, mm. to, to move into that uh, day-to-day kind of civilian population again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been difficult, like I, I have to be honest, it's, it's, a, it's a big change for me going from traveling full-time 35 weeks a year to being in the same place for one time. That's a change in itself, <laughs> never mind what you're doing work-wise. A few different things. One is you, when you're playing, it's you know your ranking is 150. You're trying to make Wimbledon, so the goal is very apparent of what you're doing. You know you're playing this tournament next week. You want your ranking to go here and so on. Whereas when you stop, it's kind of when people ask you what's the plan. I felt very. Um, I don't really know what the plan is, um, and I think it's in some ways it's becoming a little bit more comfortable with that. And then it's you know making the transition into work. I actually watched your interview with Frankie, which was really good and. I do feel similarities in that, like, you know, he's got the pendulum summit and things and, and uh, front row speakers, but um, I'm trying to use my tennis to set goals in a kind of an entrepreneurial way, like I want to be an entrepreneur, I'm working on different things, I'm involved in different things, and I'm kind of trying to find my way with that a little bit, and obviously I'm hanging around good people <laughs> to give me advice on that as well, but I think it's very different, I think, you know, now, so I've, I've started the sports desk in, in Mason Alexander and one of the components is helping athletes with their transition and, and one thing for me is going into Mason Alexander and going into the office where everyone is you know incredibly helpful but at the same time if I walk into a tennis club in Ireland I'm seen as an expert and I'm seen as I'd be known in tennis whereas when I go into Mason Alexander I'm starting out completely you know pretty much at the bottom and that like I'm learning my way I'm like little things like computer stuff that yeah. people have been doing for years that I wouldn't really be <coughs> used to and it can be frustrating and it can be difficult but yeah it's a challenge and it's still <coughs> it. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say like everything is great and everything is I feel completely comfortable and perfect and everything I think it's it's again it's back to the mindset what we were talking about earlier it's having that mindset that you're you're going to work and, hard and, and being on the road for you know, 25 weeks of the year, it's just mm. absolutely grueling. You get your injuries. Mm. It could just be so, t- you miss your fam- family and friends. What kind of advice would you offer to people on that mindset? Because there's a lot of people nowadays who are struggling for a few different reasons. Yeah. Um, what mm. advice would you offer or what advice you've been given that you've applied? Yeah, like I, I think it's about setting small, attainable goals. You know, have your big goal at the end, but then also, you know, have those, those small goals to work towards. Yeah, you're right. It's not easy. There's, you know, I would always, my thing would be, I would, I would put it in perspective. I would say, you lose a tennis match. What's the worst that can happen? A business deal doesn't go your way. You know, there's. I remember actually, funny enough, I remember being in Greece actually. So I would have played in like Uzbekistan and India and all these places. But I remember Greece and being in a taxi. I said to the guy, it was like height of the recession. I said to the guy, geez, it must be really tough kind of looked at me really serious and he's like tough he's like ah tough is living on a street in India like you just get on with it you know yeah. and I, I, I do remember that conversation and I think uh, you know I've had some um, challenges tennis wise but you know nothing that, that serious when you're now looking to kind of cut it goals for the future and kind of tennis and a few different kind of things have you got any aspirations for the next kind of couple of years yeah so I want to you know I really <coughs> want to build the uh, Mason Alexander the sports desk I want to be a, an expert with athletes and really help athletes with their transition. And we're, we're you know, I'm already meeting a lot of athletes, making the link uh, with companies. You know, I'm kind of working, working through other things as well. Again, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I would say watch this space in a lot of ways. You know, I'm really excited about the future. I'm working on different things. I have a company called Tennis for Wellness as well, which links in with corporate companies as part of their wellbeing program. So taking corporates out to play tennis, I'm excited about that as well. And, and that idea actually came from Richard. So Brilliant idea. From, um, from his playing tennis and how tennis is, is a, it's a sport that's attractive to both sexes as well. Um, there's a lot of golf days in companies, but like tennis is what I know and to try and introduce tennis to people. So let's say you're sitting down with your eight-year-old self 
what advice do you think you're offering? It's a really interesting question and I actually, you know, I've been thinking about it and in a lot of ways I wouldn't have lived any different. Like if you would ask me, I'd still, I would still go to America, I'd still play professional, I'd maybe make a few differences with my schedule and like maybe coaching and you, I would say you never know who you're meeting. My learning from Richard would be, you know, give your time as best you can to everyone. Try and help people as much as possible. So when you're, I would say that to my 18 year old self, I'd say, you know, you're in such a rush with tennis, you're in such a rush to make the top 100 and make Wimbledon and all this stuff. But if you can take a step back, the people that you meet with your sport and with life, just by having a conversation with someone, too many times you kind of don't realize who you're meeting. And, and I think it, the biggest thing is to do it in an authentic way. Obviously, you're not looking for something. But um, that's what I would say to myself. Yeah, it's good advice. And you're right, be authentic, because people can suss it out straight away. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> they, can, they can see what your angle is because they're not stupid and they can sense it. Yeah, no, I agree completely. And, and um, I think, yeah, it has to be authentic. You have to try and help someone. And I even I asked Richard, actually, funny, I, I said to him, uh, you know, a, a couple of different things. One, I said, um, so when you go to a conference, so like the pendulum, I guess, I said, how many people do you meet? I think he said like 100, say, and I said, how many people pitch you an idea? And he said, I think about 100, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. But the other thing which he did, which is, is he's, and he's written about this, is listening. So I would say that to my 18-year-old self, to really listen to people. Sometimes we spend, and I would spend too much of a conversation hoping that they were going to ask me something about tennis that I could, you know, veer into my tennis because it's a comfortable thing as opposed to actually listening to someone. So when I was on the island, Richard asked me over to Mosquito Island, which is his, his, his second island, and I went for lunch with him and there was a, a group there, it was actually the Chris Saka group, and one of Saka's friends is six foot six. And I said to him, I, I said, uh, I've got the perfect pitch for Richard. Now this is like, I'd had a drink as well. I said, I've got the perfect pitch for Richard, completely messing. Anyone who's six foot six or above, upgraded on Virgin Airlines automatically because I'm six six as well. So I'm tired of, I was like, I'm tired of being at the back of the yeah, plane. Great. So I said to Richard, I was like, oh Richard, I got the perfect, got perfect pitch for you. And I told him and he said, that's a pretty good idea. Um, let me write that down, like he's big on and you know, his book and keeping yeah, it. Yeah, keeping notes. And he said, he said, email that to me and I'll follow up on it. So I sent him the email. And then two weeks ago, I'm on Instagram and I'm scrolling through as you do. And I see a picture of Richard, front of the plane, two tallest people on the plane, upgraded them. And then he also got the two oldest people. So, and he emailed me saying, thanks for the idea as well. I just thought it was really interesting how like a throwaway comment that if someone had said that to me, probably wouldn't have been listening so like for me that was a big thing uh, it's is, really, is to it's listen really really good because what I've taken from this and is the importance of learning because the mm. first thing he said to you is I'm looking yeah. forward to learning yeah and the second thing is taking on those ideas and listening mm. and the third thing is not to be in a rush and maybe just to let things play out because you never know what will actually happen you've been listening to the what I know now podcast with Mark Kelly to subscribe to the podcast just enter WYKN in our iTunes or any Android podcast of choice or check out the website at www.wykn.com Look to get your feedback, either positive or negative about the episode, what action you're going to take. Look forward to seeing you next week and remember, have an absolutely stupid day. Bye.